segment three of properties of gases chapter 10 we're going to pick up with the ideal gas law all right so with the combined gas laws we saw that p v over t equaled some constant um, and that was keeping moles constant throughout the whole thing but with avogadro's result, results we can see that this is going to be modified um, and that constant then is actually going to be a function of the moles and then we're going to multiply the moles by a, a uh, a different constant which is R and R is going to be a universal gas constant. Now you got to be careful with R because R will have several different values um, but by looking at this this way and like looking at this equation this way we can come up with PIV inert PV equals an RT and so that is our ideal gas law. This equation um, is for the states of gases and now if we know the variables then we can calculate the fourth variable which would be the moles so we can define state of the gas by defining three of those values, all right? So hypothetical gas that obeys ideal gas law relationship over all ranges, including changing the moles now. As temperature increases um, and pressure decreases, real gases act as ideal gases. So we can force real gases to behave ideally. So what is the value of R? Well, plugging in values of T, V, N, and P for one mole of gas at STP, right? So temperature then would be 273, P would be one atmosphere. The volume would be 22.4 liters. And again, we would use one mole. We could then calculate R and it comes out to 0 0.082057 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Okay, so we can actually calculate the R value. Now, if we change any of those to a different unit, then that will change our R value, which is why I was on the last slide telling you to be careful. If you use, <clears throat> say, Google to figure out what your gas law constants are going to be, uh, make sure you're checking your units. Make sure you're putting in the right unit. of. Usually it's pressure. Or we have lots of units that we can use for pressure, which will change the value of R. So just double check you're using the right pressure unit. All right, how many liters of nitrogen gas at one atmosphere and 25 degrees C are produced by the decomposition of 150 grams of that sodium azide? So before we did it by just looking at STP, but what happens when we're not at STP? What's going to change? Okay, so now we're going to do a 25 degrees C and 150 grams. We want to know what the volume is going to be. So we know pressure is one atmosphere. We convert our T to 298.15, and then we rearrange our equation to solve for V. So N for the moles of nitrogen would be 150 grams over sodium azide, um, excuse me, 150 grams of sodium azide over one times one mole of sodium azide over 65.01 grams, that'd get rid of our grams. And then times our coefficients from our reaction gets rid of moles of sodium azide and that gives us moles of nitrogen. Now, once we have moles of nitrogen, we can plug that in so we can figure out R, T, and P or not figure out, but use them to plug that into the equation to solve for V. Moles will now cancel out, Kelvin will cancel out, atmospheres will cancel out, and our final answer will be 84.6 liters. All right. What volume in milliliters does a sample of nitrogen with a mass of 0 0.245 grams occupy at 21 degrees C and 750 torr? So, what is it that we know? Well, we have mass and identity, so we know the molar mass of the substance. We can find the moles. We know the temperature, and we know the pressure, and we're looking for the volume, and we want to make sure our volume is in milliliters. So how do I get to milliliters? Mass was 2.4, excuse me, 0.245 grams. The molar mass is 28, right? 14, I mean, you can go 28.02 if you'd like. We're going to convert our temperature from C to Kelvin, so that's going to give us 294K. And right now our pressure is in tour, <clears throat> so we want to put that in atmospheres. So we'll divide that by 760, and that gives us 0.987. So at this point, we're pretty much ready to plug and chug. We can solve for moles, and then divide that by the molar gas, molar mass. We have moles itself, and now we can rearrange and solve for V. Plugging all that in, we get 0.214 liters. The question asked for milliliters, we can convert that, and we get 214 milliliters. All right, your turn. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide. What is the pressure in atmospheres 
of CO2 in a 50 liter container at 35 degrees C when 33 grams of dry ice becomes a gas? Here are your potential answers. So again, you might want to pause this, work out the problem yourself, and see how you do. All right. Hopefully you've pushed play, you've got everything written out, and you came out to 0.379 atmospheres. So let's take a look at how we got that. So the pressure of CO2 would be equal to the mass of the CO2 converted, right? Because we need that in moles. So this ends up being moles because grams here will cancel with grams there. Once we're in moles, moles will cancel out with our R, our R factor. Because remember, we're going to do P is equal to um, NRT over V. So these two together make up N. Here's our R. We converted our temperature to Kelvin. There's T. And then V was 50 liters. All right? We run that through our calculator and we get 0.38 atmospheres. Our grams will cancel out, our moles will cancel out, liters cancels out, Kevin can Kelvin cancels out, and we're left with atmospheres. All right, if 13 moles of N2O5 decompose into NO2 and oxygen at 415 Kelvin in a 4.75 liter container that can't expand or contract, so in other words our volume can't change, after decomposition how many times greater is the pressure in the box than the atmospheric pressure, which is approximately the one atmosphere. So how many times greater? So we want to solve then for our new P. And again, pause it here, work out the problem, hit play, and hopefully 233 times greater. So how did we get there? So the first thing we needed was a balanced chemical reaction. Then we're going to take the 13 moles of the uh, dinitrogen pentoxide. Based on our balanced chemical equation, it's going to be 5 moles of gas to 2 moles. That's going to give us 32.5 moles of gas. P is equal to NRT over V. So we're going to have 32.5 moles. We're going to have our R value times the 415, and we're going to be stuck in that 4.175 liter container. All this will cancel out to give us a pressure of 233 atmospheres. And then to get the times greater, remember we said approximately one atmosphere, so we're just going to divide that by one, and that means it's going to be 233 times greater. All right. So using gases, we can determine the molecular mass of a material if we know the pressure, the temperature, and the volume, and we know the mass of the gas, we can use the ideal gas law to determine moles. Then use the mass and the moles to get the molar mass. So if you know temperature, pressure, and density of a gas, you can use density to calculate volume and mass of the gas, and you can use the ideal gas law to determine the moles of gas then use mass and moles to get the molar mass. So we'll look at some example problems here. The label on a cylinder of an inert gas became illegible, so a student allowed some of the gas to flow into a 300 milliliter gas bulb until the pressure was 685 torr. The sample now weighed 1.45 grams. Its temperature was 27 degrees C. What is the molecular mass of this gas? Which of the group 7A gases, inert gases, was it? So, what is it that we know? <clears throat> we know the volume, we know the mass, we know the temperature, and we know the pressure. So for the volume, we have 0.3 liters. All right, just canceling out the milliliters. For the mass, we were told it was 1.45 grams. I still want to convert my temperature from Celsius to Kelvin. We were told it was 27, so that's going to be 300.2, roughly. We'll convert our pressure from torr to atmosphere. So we had 685 torr. We're going to turn that into 0.901 atmosphere. Now we'll use VP and T to calculate the moles. So moles is equal to PV over RT. We'll put in our P, put in our V. R, of course, is a constant which is why we had to put into atmospheres, liters, moles, and Kelvin. 
Then we have 300.2 Kelvin. Atmospheres cancels out. Liters cancels out. Kelvin cancels out. And, of course, we're in per mole per mole, right? So it would be per per mole, which makes it mole. That gives us a 0 0.01098 mole. All right, so now we know how many moles, and we know the mass, right? So we'll use the mass of the sample and the moles we just calculated to calculate the molar mass. So 1.45 grams <clears throat> over 0 0.01098 gra uh, moles gives us 132 grams per mole. <clears throat> Excuse me. The gas then has to be xenon. Its atomic mass is 131.29, and we're pretty close. All right, molecular mass and molecular formula of a gas. A gaseous compound of phosphorus and fluorine with an empirical formula of PF2 was found to have a density of 5.60 grams per liter at 23 degrees C and 750 torr. Calculate its molar mass and its molecular formula. Now remember, the empirical formula is just the whole number ratio. So we have to figure out what the molecular formula is. So what is it we know? Well, we know the density, right? We know the temperature. We know the pressure. So the density is 5.60 grams per liter. In other words, one liter weighs 5.60 grams. So we can assume we have one liter of gas. So we're going to set the volume to be one liter. That way we know the mass is 5.60 grams. We can convert our temperature from Celsius to Kelvin. So we're going to take 23, add the 273, and we have 296.2. Last but not least, we'll take our pressure, go from tour to atmosphere. So that's going to be 750 tour divided by the 760 tour. Gives us 0.9868 atmospheres. Tours will cancel out. All right, solve for moles then. PV over RT, so we'll plug and chug this. See, so atmospheres cancel out, liters cancel out, Kelvin cancels out, and we're left with 0 0.04058 mole. Now we have moles, we have mass, we can now figure out the molar mass. So the molar mass then would be 5.60 divided by 0 0.04058, which gives us approximately 138 grams per mole. Now remember, we were asked for the molecular formula. So now we have the molecular mass, and we know the empirical formula. So first find the mass of the empirical formula unit. So we're going to take one phosphorus, two fluorine. That's going to give us 38 plus the 31 from the phosphorus. That gives us 69. Then we'll take the 138 we just figured out, divide that by the empirical formula, which is 69, and that tells us 2. That's the multiplier for our empirical formula. So it's going to be P2F4. All right. So we've covered quite a few different equations. And one of the biggest tricks is knowing which gas law to use. Right? So which gas law to use in calculations. If you know the ideal gas law, you can get all the rest. The amount of gas given we're asked for in moles or grams. The amount of gas remains constant or not mentioned. All right, so that's pretty much your two options. So the amount of gas remains a constant, so moles doesn't change, or it's not even mentioned. Then you know you're not using PV equals an RT, right? So if we have a gas law problem, and you know the amount of gas, or it's asking you for the amount of gas, you're using the ideal gas law. If it doesn't mention anything about moles, not asking you to find moles, not asking you to use moles, then you're using the combined gas law. So you really only have two options. Now remember, there are like four equations in this thing. But again, if it's not asking you for moles, at least you know you're using the combined gas law. Then you just have to figure out what's being held constant. Or if you're just using all P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. So here we go, mix and match. A 7.52 gram sample of a gas with an empirical formula of NO2 occupies two liters at a pressure of one atmosphere and 25 degrees C. Determine the molar mass and molecular formula of the compound.
Hopefully you've paused it, you've done some work, scribbled it out on paper, and you came out with B, 90. All right, so how did you know which one to do? Well, it said it wanted molar mass. So you know you're looking for moles, which means you know you're looking for PV equals an RT. So for molar mass then, we're gonna start with 7.52 grams, the mass of our sample, times R, times 298, right? You have to get our temperature in Kelvin. One atmosphere and two liters. That gives us grams per mole. If you look at the units, we didn't cancel anything else out. Got rid of the liters, got rid of the atmospheres, got rid of the Kelvin, and we have grams per mole. So we have 90 grams per mole. Now we're gonna divide that by the 45 grams per mole, because remember we're looking for molar mass, but they gave us, right, the formula, NO2. So the empirical formula was NO2. Grams per mole will cancel out and we're told two. So now the molecular formula then would be N2O4. We're just gonna multiply by that factor. All right. Our good old friend stoichiometry is gonna come back here. So stoichiometry of reactions between gases. So we can use stoichiometric coefficients and equations to relate the volumes of gases, provided that temperature and pressure remain constant. So volume then is always proportional to moles. So that means we can simply use coefficients as long as the temperature and the pressure remain constant throughout the reaction. Now, methane burns with the following equation. CH4 plus 2O2 produces CO2 and 2H2O. So as long as everything stays the same, temperature and pressure, we know we have one volume, two volumes, one volume, two volumes. The combustion of four and a half liters of methane consumes how many liters of O2 if both volumes are measured at STP? We know P and T are all constant, so just look at the ratio for the stoichiometric coefficients. The volume of O2 will equal four and a half liters times two liters of O2 divided by one liter of methane. So nine liters of O2. Now again, that's because pressure and temperature are constant throughout the reaction. In one lab, the gas collecting apparatus used a gas bulb with a volume of 250 milliliters. How many grams of sodium bicarbonate would be needed to prepare enough CO2 to fill this bulb when the pressure is at 738 torr and the temperature is 23 degrees C? The reaction is sodium bicarb plus 2HCl gives me two sodium chlorides plus that CO2 gas that I want to collect and the water. So what is it that we know? Well, we know temperature, pressure, volume, and we can figure out the molar mass of the sodium bicarb, excuse me, the sodium, sodium carbonate. What is it that we need to find? Well, we want to know the mass of the sodium carbonate. So how are we going to find that? Well, we can use the ideal gas law to calculate the moles of CO2. We can't use the constant temperature and constant pressure this time because they're not going to remain a constant. Once we know how many moles of CO2, we can convert that to moles of Na2CO3. All right, hopefully that makes sense. So we'll use the ideal gas law to calculate the moles for CO2. First, convert milliliters to liters. So it's a 250 milliliter bulb. We're gonna call that 0.250 liters. We'll convert tour to atmosphere. So we'll take our 738 tour, divide that by the 760, tells us we have 0.971 atmospheres. We'll now convert our degree C. So 23 plus 273 gives us 296. Now we're going to use the ideal gas law solving for N. N is equal to PV over RT. We just calculated the pressure to be 0.971. The volume we put in liters. We're going to use our R as atmospheres liters per mole Kelvin. And then of course we calculated our temperature to be 296.2 Kelvin. Atmospheres and liters will cancel out. Kelvin will cancel out. And that tells us we have 9.989 times 10 to the negative three moles of CO2. Now, once we have moles of CO2, we're now ready to do our regular stoichiometry here. So we're gonna do a mole to mole using the coefficients from the reaction. 
we know that's one to one. So now we know we have the same value for moles of sodium carbonate. Now all we have left to do is that last step where we convert our moles to grams. Using our periodic table, we'll get the molar mass of 106. Multiplying all that out, we get 1.06 grams of sodium carbonate. All right. Another your turn. Got a couple more here, and then we'll call it a session. So, sodium reacts with water to form sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. A lot of fun there. How many grams of sodium are required to produce 20 liters of hydrogen gas at 25 degrees C and 750 Tor? And again, as normal, you can pause, work this problem out, see how you do. And welcome back. Hopefully you got 37.1 grams. So calculating your moles of hydrogen, you're going to take your 750 Tor, convert that to atmospheres, multiply that by 20 liters, divide it by R, divide it by the 298 because you're at two, uh, 25 degrees C. That gives you moles of hydrogen. Now we can calculate the grams of sodium hydroxide, excuse me, the sodium required um, for the H2, for the gas. So mass of sodium would be moles of hydrogen, 2 to 1 from our uh, reaction coefficients, times 23 grams for 1 mole of sodium. Might be off a little bit, you might have used 2299. That gives you 37.1 grams. All right. Solid sodium carbonate, when heated, decomposes to form sodium oxide and carbon dioxide. If 27.5 grams of sodium carbonate is decomposed at 925 degrees C and the gas that results is collected in a 25 liter container, assuming the temperature of the gas is equal to 925, would you worry about the container bursting? So in other words, is your pressure going to be high or is it only going to be like an atmosphere? So are you worried about your container shattering? And again, you might want to pause here, run through some calculations. Hopefully you realize, nope, it's only going to be about one atmosphere. So first thing first, here's our reaction. We're told we have 27 and a half grams of sodium carbonate. Convert that to moles of CO2 since that was a solid. That gives us 0.259 moles of CO2. Now we're going to use PV equals an RT to calculate pressure. So that means we're going to take N, R, and then we calculate T to be 1198 Kelvin. Divide that by the 25 liters, and that comes out to 1.02. And of course, one atmosphere is close to being sea level, so no big deal there. Nothing's going to blow up on us there. All right, so again, we'll pause here, call this a segment. We're at about 23 minutes in plus the time it took you to work out those problems. And we'll pick up in segment four with Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. Looks like we have about two more segments, maybe three segments left. So hang in there, keep working at these problems, gas laws. Um, it's just a lot of math. So hopefully you guys are working your way through it and you're not struggling too much. But again, if you are, make sure you get in touch with me. Um, either come to a student hour, office hour, or um, come to the tutoring center. I'm in there as well. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, um, or again, just make an appointment and we'll set up a Zoom time when we can both meet.